If you have your Bibles with you, and I want to encourage you to always have your Bibles with you. Now if that's on your phone, that's awesome. If it's an iPad, if it's technology, that's great too. Bring your Bibles with you. Have your Bible. It's helpful, okay? Now, I mainly use my iPad. I have reading plans. I have devotionals. I have every translation you could imagine on my iPad. I can also take notes on my iPad. If you don't know how to do that, see someone younger than me because I just barely figured it out, okay? Uh, There's a lot that you can do in regards to that, but I want you to have your copy of the Scripture in whatever format that you use. I want you to get in the habit of turning to it and looking to it and remembering the things that are being taught to you. I, I just don't put everything on the screen for you. I put the notes so that you know where we're going and you understand the portion at which we're talking about. But bring your Bibles with you. If you're in need of a Bible, you tell me. I can get you one. I love giving away Bibles. When people are like, hey, I need a Bible. I say, I got you. I already have four in my office right now ready to go. I even have two for kids and two for really little kids. Actually, I have four for really little kids. uh, That they would become invested in reading the Word of God. It's extremely important. It's extremely helpful. And we're going to see why this morning uh, as we we kick off the new year. (laughs) Right? Uh, We missed last week. Uh, That happens. Um... That'll probably happen again. It's just where we live. It's what happens, and that's okay. Um, so if I forget in my notes and say, as we kick off the year, you go, yeah, we get it. We understand, right? Um, Psalm 4 is where you want to be. It tells us who it is at the very beginning. It's on stringed instruments to be a song. It's a psalm of David. But the title of the message is, is Peace in Your Problem." Now, a lot of times you may be praying that your problems would be resolved, and that's rightly so, and that would happen. But sometimes you're living in those problems, okay? And you're going to have to function through a lot of those problems. David's problems specifically were many. This one specifically could be. I say could be because we're not 100% sure when it happened in his life. It's likely the events of 2 Samuel chapter 15 through 20. Absalom revolts. Absalom is David's son. He longs to be king, and he takes it his way, forcing David to flee Jerusalem. David experiences problems. Psalm 3 is very similar, but Psalm 4 is our focus this morning. David's problems involve people. Have you ever think that this would be the greatest church in the world if it wasn't for all of the people? Right? It's like a weird way to put it. This church is awesome, but, you know, sometimes the people. Your job would be awesome. You would have the best job in the world if it wasn't for all those people, right? I remember working in customer service. It was a fun job. You always had to deal with all the people. It wasn't typically the happy people. The happy people got their stuff and left. The people that did a problem, those are the ones I got to work with. So we could understand. We will have problems with people, believers and unbelievers alike. This one is very serious, if it is the context in which David is speaking from, whether he is in it as he's fled or as he reflects on it as it happened, because we do see some past tense care carried into the future. So it's possibly a reflection of those problems, but it applies just the same when those problems come and when they happen. And I guarantee you they will, because we live among fallen people who desire to live for Christ, and we live from other people that are fallen and have no desire to live for Christ at all. You'll be around those two types of people pretty much everywhere you go. But the resolution that we want to have about all of our issues is that we want to find peace. We want to live as Jesus had preached. Blessed are those. Blessed, content. We don't want to panic. We don't want to cry out. We don't want to sound crazy. Every time a problem comes our way, we want to see what God is doing in it. We want to summarize it by saying, we can find peace. David does two things. He speaks to God, and he speaks to the people involved. Two categories. He speaks to them. First off, David speaks to God. We find peace in our problems by following these these two steps. We learn from the life of David. He's our example this morning. 
What did he go through? What do we go through? They're similar. Okay? The first thing he does is he speaks to God. When problems come, David's first move, your first move, when people problems come your way, is to speak to God. It's to speak to God, not anyone else. Started off with, do you think? No, you don't think. You say, God, I have a problem. We oftentimes think we're doing ourselves a favor by seeking out other people's wisdom. Possibly deal with the, dealing with things our own way. But look at verse 1. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Whether he's reflecting on that issue, he's reflecting on any other issue or distress that David faced. I want you to create for yourself a track record. You understand what a track record is? You go around one time, how fast did you go? One lap's a quarter mile. I don't know how long it takes. I haven't done it in forever, so I don't even want to guess. I wouldn't even say a minute. You should be able to do it faster than that. I don't know if you should or not. I can't remember. You go around. You go around again. Did you do it faster or slower? Do you want to be faster? Do it faster. Do that again. That's a track record. We want to hear from God. We want to see what God has done. We want to remember what He's done. As we're speaking to God, we have to remember that He has given relief in the past. Has He not? Have you not turned to God? Have you not cried out in your distress because you've already felt, heard, and seen Him work in any other way? Think about Facebook memories. If you take pictures and post things on Facebook, Every once in a while, Facebook will give you this little, hey, you have memories to look back on today. Isn't that exciting? Seven years ago, 14 years ago, however long you've been on Facebook years ago, it's a photo. Jamie had one, I think it was yesterday or the day before. And it's Lincoln as he's this tall. And it's Brady, probably the age he can't really balance himself in a chair too well. And they're in our youth room. The drum set is there, and I'm not sure what's happened, but Lincoln has gotten two of the sticks, and Brady has two of the sticks, and they're just banging away. No rhythm, no nothing. And you see little Brady, and he's sitting in that chair, and he's banging away on it, and he's kind of like, uh, he could fall out of that chair at any moment. But I, I remember so much from that time. Our youth room had this rectangular area. It's almost exactly the way the gym over there. It's an overflow upstairs section. We painted the wall a dark maroon because that was cool. And we left out a section in the wall that's white for the projector to shoot on. Because we didn't have a screen. We didn't want to install a screen. And I remember all those times of painting with the different teens that came to help and the carpet that we ruined and the way we tried to clean it up, which spread it even further. And then we were just honest with the janitor and said, hey, we did that. We just want to let you know. And she said, I can take care of that. I remember all of that. I remember all the times that God was good just from one little memory of my little kids playing on the drum, right? The, the, it floods back, doesn't it? Memories, that's what that does for us. You need to... As you speak to God, remember the ways that which He's answered your request. The way He has, is sustaining you as you're waiting for an answer. You need to let those things flood your heart and your mind. When problems come, start there. Start there. You have given me relief. You've done it before. You've helped me before. But listen, David is shaken. He's off balance. He's king. His own son has said, I'll be king. And he's thrown out. He's desperate. But he steadies himself by remembering who God is. You saw the one photo of the jousting over the foam pit. You walk out on this little bitty foam-covered pad, which is really hard to, to stand on as an adult that's as tall as I am. And you go up against your son, who's a little bit shorter than you, and you hope for the best. Because the worst thing that can happen is you fall into the foam pit. You say, oh, that's, what's so bad about that? It's, it's getting out of the foam pit. Jumping off the little higher section into the foam pit, that's so much fun. But I was like, oh, man, once I jump in there, i got to crawl back out. I don't want to go in the foam pit. I want to steady myself and deal with my problems. Distress is what that's like. It's when life or the situation 
has allowed you to be knocked into the foam pit. God is there, going to provide comfort and help to you, as we're going to see that he did the same for David. He remembers who God is when he says, Answer when I call, O God of my righteousness. My identity, my value, my purpose, the one who loves me more than anyone else, the one who has ordered my steps, the one who's placed me in various places, that's who he remembers. He steadies himself. God is a God who does right, who sees right, judges right, and acts right in all of his decisions. God is not distracted. These things are personal for David. They're as personal as they are for each of us as we remember our salvation. The God of my righteousness is the God of my salvation. The one who sent his son to die for a wretched sinner like me, who's given me new life, who's given me purpose, who graciously forgives me, allows me to serve in a job that I love, who's gifted me with talents that I hope give him all the glory. I hope that you can say the same thing as you walk and go through the life that you live. But listen, David has a lot of practice with problems. He's been in pressure situations as a shepherd. He's been in stressful situations relationally as he served the previous king. And now he's facing another as he is the king. If you serve in any way, shape, or form in leadership, whether that's in this church or in your job, in your relationships, when you're the one that makes the decisions, it can become difficult because those decisions impact people. I've been comforted by that truth. Someone told me one time, just make the right decision and someone will always disagree with you. Don't worry about it. And I said, well, that, that, no, everybody should agree with me 100%. No, that's not how that works. I shared that with someone else who had to make an on-the-spot pretty difficult decision. That no matter what you do, someone's going to be upset. Do the thing that you believe is what God's called you to do and what is right and what's already been planned. Do that. Because if you do it the other way, different people are going to be upset with you and do it the other way. At least you'll have known that this is what God's called me to do and I'll honor him first and foremost before anyone else. David has to deal with that. I remember these different types of problems that, that come up. The kind that throw you off, the kind that upend your life. Think about a kid, one of my own actually. He was playing a video game, and they make their own little worlds, and they invite their friends to play in these little worlds where they build their houses and streets and whatever, so I don't know what they do. I play it with them sometimes, but half the time I don't know what I'm doing, but they do have fun. And he led a bunch of friends into his world, and they were playing, and then those little friends turned into those little brats that you know, and said, watch this, we're going to blow up and break all your stuff. He's very creative in the way he's made these things. He's put a lot of time into it, and his little heart was broken when his little dingbat friends, which... <laughs> That's what they are, and you know what I'm talking about. When they come at your kids, you're like, oh, wow. He started to scream into the microphone and started to yell, and my reaction at first was, it's just a game. Stop screaming and control yourself. And I was angry at first, but then I stopped and thought, where is he at in his passion, his understanding with righteousness and the vindication of God? It's not there 100%. But he came upstairs, and I just said, what's wrong? And through tears, they destroyed everything. They're so stupid. I can't stand it. It's not fair. And instead of me teaching him all the holiness of God or telling him that his friends are just as bad as he thinks, I just gave him a hug. I didn't know what else to do. Like, I, I get frustrated about games, right? Because you're like, oh, you play that game all the time and you build this stuff. I don't understand it. But it's like, all right, I understand your joy. I just gave him a hug. Imagine this, answer me when I call. That was kind of my child's prayer. Like, I need your help, Dad. There's nothing I could do in regards to fixing that problem. He knew I was there for him, but he thought I'd probably get in trouble for screaming. When we had that conversation, calm down a little. But God brought relief, and I tried to do that for him. But God, in our problems, presents us with an understanding that we can turn to him, and he will listen. And not only will he listen, he will act. For his glory. I try to mirror that for my children. I don't always get it right. You don't always get it right, but we try. And we want to honor God and glorify him. But we understand that we have problems. And through those problems, the more they come, the more we gain practice in them, we listen 
to what God is saying. Because through the faithfulness of His love for us, in the problems that He allows our way, we learn our need for Him. We learn that there is no other wise thing that we should be doing other than first and foremost turning to Him and talking to Him about our problems. And as we talk with Him, we listen. David says, be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Speaking to God was David's first move. Like so many things in the Christian life, we have to learn to speak to God about our problems. And it takes time. It takes practice. But it does take problems, and they keep coming, and then we keep trying to deal with them in the ways in which we think is best. And we frustrate ourselves if we would all of a sudden stop and remember, I should talk to God first. No one else. Not your spouse. Not your parents. Not your pastor. To God. Talk with Him. Share it with Him. Open your heart to Him and listen. David And his first step in finding peace is that he turns to God. He asks him to do something. He asks him to set the record straight. After God, he speaks now to those who are involved. The people that are involved, there's three different people. The first one is this, David responds to the malicious the malicious people. They're the ones that are causing the problems. They're the ones that have used words that have led to actions to attack him as king and to de- depose him as king, to throw him out. Malicious people, those are the people that use their words or their actions to do harm. That's their goal. That's their point. That's their plan. That's why they said it. They want to hurt you. David responds to them. They're making up stories. They've been lying. They've convinced others of a truth that is not a truth. In verse 2, he says, O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Selah. That's a word that we see. And I think I'm saying it wrong half the time. If you hear a Hebrew person say it, it's going to sound totally different. But it's a pause and rest and reflection word, best believed. That's what we think it means. It's time to pause and stop and think. Here's some truth that you've heard, and when you see that word selah, it means just pause and reflect. Think on it, okay? David's basically saying, how long are you going to keep this up? I know you're lying. I know that you're wrong. How long are you going to continue to do this? Uh, The word for men, those who love the vain words, it means those of power and influence. I don't know that many of you here are social media influencers. Maybe you are, and I don't know it. Maybe you have a million followers. I don't know. I don't. I'm getting close to like 260. That's just because I worked at two different churches, and I think a lot of those people still follow me. I'm impressed. I was like, wow. But then I see other people's stuff, and I'm like, you have 14,500 followers? You meet a person who has a million followers? That's an influential person. The problem for our society today is sometimes pastors strive for that in an arrogant way, and then they say foolish things, and so many people hear it, and so many people believe it, and so many people follow it. But influencers are the ones in and around your life that can speak things to other people, and they'll believe it. That's the people he's saying. How long are you going to continue to turn what I'm doing for the glory of God into shame? How long are you going to keep lying about this? You ever had that happen to you? Work, church, family? You work hard, you do good, and they go, oh, he's just trying to get attention. He's just trying to be popular. Oh, he's trying to get his way. Oh, it's all about whatever you're actually not about, but that's what they make it about, and it frustrates you, doesn't it? It hurts. Malicious people are saying things about King David and others are believing them. They're destroying his reputation. It's doing serious damage. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Do you ever tell that to your kids? It's kind of true. But it's kind of not, and this is the way I heard it, and I know you probably have ten different ways you can say it. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will cut through my heart. Right? 
I'm not saying line up after church and beat me with a stick and break my arm and tell me the sermon was too long, right? I don't like that. Would you ever imagine the things that you've said about other people, how they would receive those things if they heard it? I mean, it's a good practice to always speak of people the way you would if they were actually standing next to you. It's a good thing because your words cut harshly into an individual. But listen to what the Bible says about words. They have the power of life and death, according to Proverbs 18.21. Words can be like sword thrusts, Proverbs 12.18. A thrust with a sword. I have one in my office. I thought about bringing it out here and using it as an example, but I probably would have hit myself, hurt myself, or dropped it into my foot somehow. It's not the sharpest sword you've ever seen, but if I thrust it at you in anger or in say, I'm just playing, I'm just joking, and I thrust that sword at you, uh, this is your last day at church, right? You're like, that pastor's nuts. He about stabbed me with a sword that's pretty blunt, and I probably would have got a serious infection from that, unlikely the pain I would have experienced, right? That's what our words are like. So you be mindful how you communicate about other people. Sword thrusts and scorching fire, Proverbs 16, 27. I had matches out yesterday because I was trying to repair a pair of boots that I have because I enjoy doing that, restoring the leather, and it didn't go well. But I was using a match to heat up the oil that I was going to be putting on them to condition them. I don't know if you know that. Great story. But I just used a match, and you kind of get the heat stuff up and play with it and do whatever. It's a little fire. And then later on, I'm sitting in the kitchen, sitting in the living room, and all of a sudden I'm like, ah, it smells like the house is on fire again. Like, it smells like something's burning? Everybody's like, yeah, what's burning? My oldest child walks through. Oh, I was playing with some of the matches. I thought, oh my goodness, he's just like me. I about burned a field down one time. I almost set the garage on fire one time. But, but a match is not what we're talking about. You ever see one of those propane heaters turned into a torch? You can turn the propane heater on, you get a little spark and a lot of pressure, and it's a blowtorch. That's what your words are like if you're not careful. I will speak harshly. I will speak my truth. I will offend people. It's a scorching fire. That's what it's like. That's what David is feeling. You understand that you can cause that by your very word. David's problems involve people lying and the ruining of his reputation. But David pursues peace. He's determined to hear God talk over anyone else. When malicious people speak hateful words, David and us, we too, should determine to hear what God's words are for us and about us. The word translated godly is the Hebrew word hasid. It's the one loved by God who loves him back. Verse 3, but know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears When I call to him, David remembers God's promises of unfailing love to him. He's the anointed king. He's been promised protection, and he's been promised access. Access to God. You've been given that same access through Jesus Christ. What we need to hear most when the vicious, malicious, sword thrust, scorching fire words come our way because of people. We need to hear what God says first and foremost. We need to hear that more than anything. It needs to be a resounding echo in our hearts and in our minds. We have to hear Him over the crowds or the individuals of those who want to tear us down. For any reason, we need it most. Listen, you're not King David. I'm not trying to make you into that character specifically. But understand, if what he has, you have. We have it through Christ. Romans 8.32 says, If God is for you, who can be against you? And you might actually right now go, Here's who! And then you start listing off the names. These people are against me. And here's what they're saying. Pastor, you don't understand. It's continual. It's all the time. I'm trying to do my best. I'm trying to walk in grace. And all the, and you can list them. They just keep attacking. I'm tired. I'm sick of it. God calls. He hears. I'm for you. You are God's child. You are His. He's bought you with a price. 
He promises you protection and he promises you access. One of the protections is that he will guard your heart from those words. He'll allow you to see his words overshadowing it. God has adopted you. You are a treasured, valued child of God, Ephesians 1.5. You are a valued child of God. Hear that. Your coworkers think you're an idiot. They, they, they can't stand the way you work, the way you function, your holiness, the way you worship God, the way you walk, the way you walk. They can't stand it about you because you're a child of God. Don't forget that. God hears you. 1 John 5.15 Isaiah 64.4 reminds us that God acts on our behalf. We call out to Him in our distresses. We call out to Him in our difficulties. He hears us when problems come. Granted, I understand it's hard to hear God when you have swords stuck in you and you're on fire. Right? What do you hear then? You ever go down in the gym in the middle of the VBS celebration night? Try and have a real honest conversation with somebody? <laughs> no. Because what do you hear? Man, you hear chaos and fun. We like to call it controlled chaos. Why is it controlled? Because it's inside. But it's chaos. I get that. Kids screaming. Kids are getting more and more sugar. And they're burning it off. It's hard to talk then. But think about it. And this is one of the, the things that you need to pray for our church people. Because they go to work where people have the swords ready. They're going to work to, to provide a living, to honor God with their labor, and the swords are coming, and the fire is getting set. And they're facing it Monday through Friday, 40 to 50 hours a week, and they, that's difficult. You pray for them. You pray that they would turn to God, and as it's addressed, David speaks to them. But he speaks to God, and he asks God to act. He continues as he speaks to the people involved, those that are malicious, those that are doing it, those that are speaking harshly. But he leaves his vindication in God's hand, the one who will set things right. Now, next, David responds to the angry. These are your supporters. This is the mama bear, right? You ever you familiar with that term? You ever go full mama bear on somebody, right? Well, not my kids, right? You go, you just, you, you're going to attack mode. I always see that and go, oh boy. Here comes a testimony uh, denting event, possibly. We need some care and concern. Calm down, right? You always see it show up on Facebook. Blah, and it's, ah. I always want to text, would you please calm down? Maybe log out of your Facebook. Because by the time you remember your password to log back in, you'll, you'll calm down, right? Be cautious. I'm just saying, it can happen to me too. But these are his supporters. Listen to Abishai, David's nephew, when someone named Shimei curses David. Right? Here's an individual who curses David. And Abishai says, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. How dare you talk about my kids? How dare you talk about my wife? That way? How dare you talk about my church people like that? How dare you talk to somebody that I love and care for? How dare you? I would take your head off. This is an example in Scripture. It doesn't mean it's, that's what you do. I'm just saying it's recorded that he was so compassionately angry, he called somebody else a name and jumped to the level of death to deal with it. And both of those are wrong. But David speaks to the angry people. He says, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. And he says, Selah. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. So the Hebrew word for being angry means to tremble or shake. Some of the virgins say tremble not. It's trembling and shaking with anger or fear. Have you ever been that angry at someone that you get that like, you know, you tense up and you're like, Ooh! you make that noise, right? You, is it just me? Do you ever get that angry? Or you're like, oh, none of us get that angry. What's wrong with you? No, I know you do. I will find a way to see, right? Like, I know you do, all right? You're not going to just be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I do. I get angry all the time. Okay, but you will. But the angry is mentioned in Ephesians, be angry and do not sin. There is such things as a right anger. Envy, murder, strife, lies, hate, 
gossip, slander, rebellion, pride, disobedience to parents, and unbelief stir God's anger. God hates those things. He's angry. And the reason He's angry is because He loves, and those things ruin and destroy the creation that He loves. You should be rightfully angry when an individual does any of these things. A righteous anger. Now, does that mean off with their heads? Let's go get them. Let's go down to that one guy who said that our Halloween outreach was the dumbest thing he's ever been to. Let's go find that guy. Yeah, let's get him. After church, load up. Follow me down there. We're knocking on his door. That guy was rude. Let's get him. Nobody? Okay, what if I say they said your kids were the ugliest costume kids they'd seen in their entire lives? Now you're now you're we're like now you were like, well, who said that? Now you're now you're leaning in. Wait a minute, whoa. About my kid, who's Pastor, you can tell me. I won't do anything. But who was it? I'm gonna pray for him, right? That's like no, now you now you now you know anger because you're like, oh, yeah, that might get me. I might I might go off on that one. But anger, anger is a demand for justice. Whose justice are we calling for? Let's call it ours, right? You ever see outlaw justice? You ever see the hero? The good guy that's kind of bad? He doesn't arrest the people and send them to court. He kills them or throws them off a cliff or does whatever. That's all the craze in Hollywood. That's what always happens. People are like, oh, yeah, the hero. He just, yeah, justice. We want right justice. Anger itself is not wrong, but... Anger can turn into the milk that we leave outside in the summer. The longer it sits there, the worse it gets. When we sit there with unrighteous anger calling for our justice, our anger is now sin. We have to be cautious when it says be angry and don't sin. For starters, David says ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Think it over and keep quiet. How long do you need to count before you act so that you are not angry in a selfish way? Is it 10 seconds? Ah, Maybe. Remember that? Count to ten. Calm down. Go for a walk. All these other strategies. He doesn't say that. He says, ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Should you be as angry as you are? This person's openly rebelling against God. This person is speaking lies about God's people. He's doing it. We all know that it's happening. And I am so angry. I'm so fired up. I want to put that person... But how can we do it? We have to pause. Pause in our anger. Think it over and keep quiet. Do you know? Did you see what they did? No, that's not it. That's not not the way it goes. You see, God, in David's time, has allowed for sacrifices to be made for those whose sins will be forgiven. He says... Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. I believe he's teaching them and telling them as they pause and reflect, it would cause them to remember the sacrifices needed for their own sins. A person blaspheming the name of God, what do you think you were doing before you became a child of God? You were doing the same thing. What did God show you? He showed you his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness He allowed you to believe and call in the name of Christ and to experience God's holiness through Christ's work on the cross. He gave that to you. Can you stay that mad at an individual that you know needs that? And you'd say, we doesn't deserve that. Here's what they've done. No, no, no. we, We don't get to say that about people. We will have our demand for justice tempered. It will slow down when we remember, I want them to find the grace of God. I want them to know what forgiveness is like. You'll know you have unrighteous anger towards someone else when you would even withhold an opportunity to share the forgiveness of Christ with them. If you won't even pray for that individual to find the forgiveness of of Christ, if you won't pray for that, you have an unrighteous anger towards someone. And that's a difficult place to find yourself. R.C. Sproul is one of the different authors that I read some of his stuff from. Uh, He has since passed away, but he was a college professor. And when he taught uh, different classes, the first day of class, he was clear. Every student, there are three short papers that you will write on three different topics. And here's the dates. Here's when they're due. If they are late, uh, there will be no mercy. 
So here comes the first time the papers were due. A couple of people were late, but he went ahead and accepted them, showed them grace. The second paper came due, and even more students were late. They begged him to have mercy, and he agreed. When the third paper came due, a majority of the class said, we'll get it into you sometime next week. And he said, no more late papers. None of them will be accepted this time at all. And one of the students yelled out, that's not fair. You ever said that? You ever think that? You compare your life with others and kind of your contemplation and communication with God is, that's not fair. Fair. Think of it. The first round, a few people were late. The second round, more people were late. Why? Because they found out there was more grace and leniency, so they misordered their schedule. The third time it came around, a majority of them are now thinking, he's going to give us grace. We can function on our own schedules. And he says, no, that's not fair as the students cry. And then he responds with, do you want justice? You were late with both of your previous papers. You get an F for both now because I'll give you justice. Do we want God's justice if it's dealt in that manner? Not for us. No way. We would not pray, God, expose my sin and deal with me justly, expose it, and harshly destroy my life. I love you, Lord. We don't say that about ourselves, but man, we will easily turn at someone else and go, God, there's the target. That's the one. Expose them. Destroy them. It would almost be right that the king would say, destroy these people, kill these people, remove them. They're the problem. But he doesn't. We're shown justice and mercy, and it's what we would ask for for others. Because our biggest problem is God's anger over our sin, at which he's dealt with on the cross. He poured out his anger, his righteous anger, onto Christ. As we called on him, he forgave us of all our sins. We will trust in God's vindication, and we will see it take place as the same we've seen it on the cross. Christ dies on the cross, rose from the dead three days later, sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. He does that, and we call for His perfect justice. We call for His perfect justice. That's how we can become angry, but not sin. We pray that God would work and God would move, God would vindicate, God would make things right, and we will trust Him as we wait for those things to happen. David's responded to the malicious and the angry, and now he's going to give his attention to those that are depressed. Verses 6 and 7. Some of the supporters of David are extremely angry that this has happened. They want to go cut heads off, they want to fight, and they want to do it themselves. Others are discouraged and weary. They wonder when they'll catch a break. Is that your season of life right now? I wonder when things are going to change. It feels like everything's horrible. It seems like every letter or phone call or email that you open is another road you're going to have to walk down that you weren't prepared for, that you don't like, you don't want, and you're doing everything you should do, and these things keep happening in your life. What do you do? The first part of verse 6, who will show us some good? Who shows all things as all good? God does. This is being pointed out that their attitude was prevalent and persistent. It's a constant. They keep on saying, when will these problems stop? I don't know when that problem's going to stop for you. I don't know how far into it you are. I don't know when or how or what the relief that God will deliver will look like. But you can find peace as you go through that problem. David prays, lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. David includes himself. Problems are hard, problems are discouraging, problems are exhausting. But David knows that what he and his friends need most is to know that God is with them. One of the greatest blessings we can be given as individuals is our relationship with God. It's to know that God is with you. In your own mind, you don't just say, well, God's with us, like the church. God's with us, like believers. No, you say, God is with me. God is with me personally. God is with me as an individual. The more as David grew in his walk with God, his relationships would move from theoretical to practical. And that's what I'm asking you to do. Uh, Don't just know what the Bible says about it. Experience it and see it happen. 
I'm not saying understand what I'm saying. Oh, you get that or you don't get that. I need you to see that it's not just theory that you go, yeah, that sounds good for some people, but it doesn't seem to work out for me. It does work out for you. It's exactly the same. Turn to God first. Trust that He will take care of you, that He does hear you. God, David explains how he feels because of this truth. Verse 7, he says, when the grain and wine abound, things are going great. But David says he has more joy in his heart than those people. Look at the people right now who, to you, it seems like their lives are going good. And you say, I wish my life was like that, because I want the peace and joy that they have because of all the good situations that are going on. Except God is saying, I'm going to walk you through and allow a series of problems in your life so that you will learn to trust me and lean on me more. So I and you will have a greater walk and relationship together. You will have a greater peace there than when things are good. Here's how you know when things are kind of bad sometimes, right? You open the letter and you go, oh, there's that procedure that we had done, and we owe, I don't know, what's 1300 bucks? You're like, well, where's that coming from? <laughs> I don't know. God will provide, okay? I can tell you in certain ways, even most recently for myself, financially, we're like, okay, we want to do this, we want to do that. We try and schedule things, put them on the calendar, and we kind of write down, well, that's going to cost this much, we need this much money. Here's one thing we want to go and do. Uh, that's extra. We didn't really plan for that one going to cost X amount of dollars. Something came up. I got X amount of dollars. And I thought, what a coincidence, right? No. No, God would hear my distress. And I'm not making it this major distress like, oh, whoa, are we? We have nothing. I'm just saying we're being smart. And we want to do this. We kind of pray like, all right, well, it'll work out. And it did in a way that I could say I glorify God. And I don't know how it worked out that way. But he heard me because I prayed. And I can say, I, he'll do that again. Because he cares for me. He knows my needs. He knows my wants. But when things are going good, that's when we forget God. When it's when we find ourselves in our problems. And if we will practice it properly, we will grow in our relationship with him. We will find our dependency on him all the greater because those problems will become so large that we don't know how to handle them. Right? Maybe you're dealing with all of life's issues really well because that's just who you are. You're a dominant personality. You like to conquer and make a to-do list and knock it out. And you're just good at that. And then a problem comes your way that you aren't ready for and you can't handle. What do you do? You try it again, make a list, do a thing. It doesn't work. And you say, wait a minute, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to turn to him first. See, listen, David's circumstances don't change. You understand that? His circumstances at the time did not change, but he found peace. What's God doing in your problems? In the struggle, He's teaching you to hear Him talk and experience Him at work. You'll never find that if you're never in the Word of God. You'll have a harder time seeing how that looks when you're not around the people of God. He oftentimes, in His wisdom, will set up disappointments about our false hopes. The thing that you're wrongly holding on to, he allows a disappointment to come in that area so that you will know that you can turn to him and trust in him and you will be freed from the illusion of thinking you can do it all. You can't. And he doesn't do it in a vindictive, cruel way. He does it in a loving way that says, come and see my glory. Come and see my power. Come and see what I can and will do for you. I understand your problems. My son has walked in the very problems that you've walked in. He knows your heart. He knows your cry. And he's listening, and he will act. He's with us. It's what we call him to do. Listen, after all of those steps, David finds rest. We don't come to the conclusion and go, David was restored to the kingdom, and all was well, and everybody loved him, and everybody always agreed with him, and everything was good. That didn't happen. But David finds peace. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. In a moment at which he's at his least safe. Because where is he? He's out of the throne. He's no longer the king. It's not that he's just not the king and he got a new apartment next to the castle. It's he's not the king and let's kill him so that he never comes back again. And men are searching and looking for him. And he can say, in peace, I both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. Could you imagine? I'm going to lay down and go to sleep knowing there's people out there trying to kill me. Not that just people don't like you and talk bad about you. Okay, I know that's difficult. 
Are people trying to kill you? That's a little different. You go to sleep completely different thinking. Someone's trying to kill me. But he didn't anymore. David takes to heart the weight and significance of what God is doing in his life. God is with him. God is with you. Will you understand that as you face problems throughout this upcoming year? He's doing that in your problems. He's growing you to be like Christ. Peter says this in 1 Peter 2, 21-23, For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. In your problems, in your difficulties, especially with people, you leave it to God who will judge rightly. Pray that that individual finds forgiveness for the things that they're doing. Pray that God would show them grace and it would turn their heart. If God does judge them, he would do so rightly, showing them love so that they would repent and not be destroyed. That's a righteous anger. You know what they're doing is wrong and you're waiting on God to make those changes. David found peace in his problems and we can do the same. But it's a common regular occurrence that when the problems arise, go to God first. Ask Him for help and listen to Him. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing, Yet not I, but Christ in me. I want to read you some of the parts of this song to prepare you as you're going to sing a truth that you've just heard preached. Okay? One of the sections, To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Further down another chorus, to this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley He will lead, He will vindicate, He will deal with your problems. You're going to sing this just like it would be like Psalm 4. Further down, to this I hold, my sin has been defeated. The greatest problem that we had was our sin before our righteous God. My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Who am I going to talk to? Who am I going to go to? I'm going to go to Jesus. And listen to this. And we need to start singing it this way, okay? And I'm not making you do it, but you, I know we're not Pentecostal, so we're not going to scream, right? But we're going to say, oh, the chains are released. Remember the chains that held you in sin and captivity? They've been released. I can sing, I am free. I remember this at the Serve Boldly conference. We went to the section on worship leaders and how to get your church to sing. And sometimes he goes, well, sometimes you sing the song and you're like, oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I'm free. You're like, woo, did anybody feel that one? The other one, he says, you can overdo it and go, oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free. Like it's a fun game. Well, you don't want to do that either. You want to hit it right down the middle. Oh, the chains are released. Remember that. This, the sin that, that cursed you has been taken to the tree. On that cross, Christ took it away. I can sing, I am free. I have new life. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. My future fear of death is conquered. Because where do I go the moment I die? I go home. I go home to be with the Lord, and day by day I know He will renew me. Where's my strength? Where do I constantly have to turn every day? Not my wisdom, not my thinking, not some other author, not some other book, but God's Word. He will renew me. That's what David says throughout the Psalms. He renews me, He hears me, until I stand with joy before the throne. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Some of you are facing some really difficult problems. I, I know of some of them. I don't know of others. I'm praying for most all of you as I sense and feel and understand you have difficulty. We're all doing that. We're all going to continue to pray for one another fervently that we and our problems will find peace because of Christ. Every time we get to that chorus section, yet not I, but through Christ in me, I want you to hear yourself saying to yourself, but I think I can do it, or I think I'm getting too tired. No, you're not. Stop thinking it's up to you and start saying, not through me, but through Christ in me. 
I'll be able to find peace in my problem. Will you stand with me? I'll close in prayer, and we'll sing that song together and be dismissed. Lord, thank you for your comforting word. Thank you for the wisdom that you give to us. Thank you for allowing us to know that you hear us. You are not a distant God. You are not one who has to be sought out through confusion, through labors that we are unsure of. We know that in our hearts and in our minds, we can turn to you. We can call on your name. You hear us. Not only do you hear us, you will act on our behalf. God, there's many here I know there's weights of problems and difficulties they've been carrying for quite some time. I pray that today they would be overwhelmed by the comfort and peace that they will find as they trust that what they're going through is for your glory. Help them see opportunities to bring joy and glory to your name because you're with them. You intercede on their behalf, God. Would you move? Would you act in a way that will restore and renew a right spirit within them that they will praise you all the more? As we wait for that deliverance, as we wait for that answer, God, would you help us be faithful to you? I pray for each person here to have a hunger for the Word of God, that they would dig deeply into it, they would find questions, they would ask, they would find answers, they would become more and more Christ-like every single day. God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.